You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from UChicago's Becker Friedman Institute. So this is a very simple paper that I have with one of my colleagues here, Amit Seru, and Joao Granja, who was a PhD student here in accounting and is now at Sloan. Um, this is what this paper is about. Okay? This is sort of bank failures from 1995 to 2015. And what I'd like you to notice is that there are no bank failures pretty much before the recent crisis. Okay? The average number of bank failures from 1994 to 2006 is five a year. We get about to 15 is the max we see. In 2010, that number jumps to 157, okay? So the recent recession, huge jump in bank failures. What's interesting about bank failures is that when banks fail, they're taken over by the um, FDIC, Federal Dep Deposit Insurance Corporation. And the way the FDIC disposes of these banks, the way they deal with them, is they sell 95% of these banks, okay? Um, and bank failures are costly for the FDIC. And they're costly potentially for society as a whole, but for the FDIC, those bank failures added up to about $90 billion okay, in total costs because FDIC is on the hook for your insured deposits, right? So if you stick a deposit in the bank, it's insured up to $250,000. FDIC is the one that pays you if the bank defaults on you. So FDIC loses a boatload of money. At some point, this is 2009, their fund is actually underwater to the tune of about $20 billion, okay? Um, so you can see how this is kind of a big deal. Uh, bank failures in the recent crisis were quite interesting. Um, by the way, FDIC is not the sole sort of party that's on the hook for bank failures. And these banks were on the hook for another $50 billion from TARP and so on, okay? So it's not surprising that the huge number of bank failures and very expensive bank failures led to a vociferous debate, debate about what to do when banks are failing, okay? You have a bunch of options of what you could do. You could bail out a bank, and you could bail it out in several clever ways. You could give them money directly. You could bail out their debt holders. You could inject equity directly. You have TARP and so on. You could liquidate a bank, right? You can just take a bank, take its assets, sell off the assets, pay off depositors, and call it a day. You can sell a bank, which means you get new owners, the FDIC is on the hook for whatever's left over and move on. And I'm sure we can come up and we will come up in the next 10 years with very other various clever ways to deal with bank failures. Okay. Now, before we talk about what happens to banks when they're sold, I think we need to understand why you might want to save banks at all. I mean, firms fail all the time. We don't seem to have a big policy that says, oh, the mom and pop shop next door is failing, let's bail it out. Let's have a complicated system of you know, selling it and so on. So I think the proponents of banks, of saving banks, say that you know, banks are special. They make loans, and when you make loans, you have relationships with your borrowers. So if a bank dies, you can't just have another bank spring up in its place and do these amazing lending that a bank would be doing. Okay? Another one is human capital. So it's not that easy to just start a bank around the corner if a bank fails because you have to have loan officers that are specialized. You're providing sort of useful, potentially, services. So if a bank closes, we potentially lose the human capital and the relationships, okay? So people who want to bail out banks, what they're saying is these two dimensions of banks are really important. If a bank dies, we lose all this good stuff. People who don't like bailouts said, hold on, do we need to bail out a bank, give it all sorts of taxpayer money just to preserve the human capital and relationships? Why not sell a bank, okay? If you sell a bank, you don't fire the people. So human capital is preserved. You have the loan officers who still deal with the same banks. The relationships are preserved. So selling banks in some way seems like a much, much better way to deal with bank failures than bailing them out. So why in the world would we deal with TARP, okay? And maybe in the past, as my colleague John Cochran says, there were barriers to selling banks. For example, back in the day, you weren't allowed to sell a bank past its state lines. Okay? So when Continental Illinois failed in the you know, late uh, 80s, you weren't allowed to sell it outside of Illinois. You had to then change laws to be able to do that. That's not the case anymore. Okay? Maybe in the past, you had sort of IT that wasn't that good. So if a bank in California bought a bank in Oklahoma, 
It was really hard to link their IT systems. That was hard to do. But guess what? We've had an IT revolution. That's not a problem anymore. Okay? So that kind of tells us, wow, maybe selling banks is the thing to do. Why in the world are we spending all our effort on these complicated ways of bailing banks up? Where this paper starts is it says, OK, seems like selling bank banks is theoretically an awesome idea. The FDIC sells a lot of banks. 95% of the banks they get, they sell. Okay? What do we actually know about what happens to banks when they fail and when they're sold? Turns out we know practically nothing. Or to be precise, we know nothing since 1987 or something. Okay? So in this paper, we have one simple goal. Bring some data to bear on this theoretically interesting and regulatorily important issue. Okay? So what are we going to look at in this paper is simply, when a failed bank gets sold, who buys it? Does it matter, from the perspective of the FDIC, how these banks are allocated? Do you get bigger costs that are borne by the taxpayers or the FDIC, or smaller costs when the right people buy it? What interferes with this process of selling a bank? Okay. At the end of the day, we're going to come down with some very, very simple facts. If you had this idea that because deregulation and IT has allowed a bank from California to buy a failing bank in Oklahoma, that just doesn't happen. Okay? Banks get sold incredibly locally. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. I mean, banks are generally sold to another bank that's got branches in the same zip code. They don't get sold out of state, across the country, and so on. That'll tell us a lot about what banks do. Okay? The other thing that we see is that when banks are sold, Failed banks are generally bought by other banks that are in similar, similar lines of business. That shouldn't surprise you. If you're a bank that has an insurance business, you're likely not going to be bought by a bank that doesn't know how to do insurance. Okay? We'll see that that's an important dimension. The last dimension that's going to interact with how banks, failed banks are sold is how well capitalized are the potential buyers of a failed bank. That'll be the primary friction we think about when we want to think about allocating failed banks. If the banks that look like you, that are close to you, are poorly capitalized, then you will be sold to banks that look different from you, that are farther away and potentially less efficient at running the failed bank. And we'll see that actually, this not only uh, it, we don't only see that in the data, it also leads to larger costs to the FDIC. So this is sort of a relevant thing that messes with the allocation of failed banks. And at the end, I'm going to try to tie all these things together and show you that there's kind of fire sales when you try to sell a failed bank. Okay. This so is a standard thing we see when we try to sell financial products. Okay. Before I get on with how we do all this stuff, I think it's useful to talk a little bit about the institutional background of how banks fail, how are they sold, how is the process determined, and so on. So you want to think about a bank as being monitored by federal or state regulators. Okay? And as a bank's health is declining, at some point, the federal or state regulator has to say, huh, this bank kind of sucks. Okay? We have to figure out what to do with it, and we are obliged to call the FDIC and say, this bank is critically undercapitalized, meaning its ratio of capital to assets has dropped below 2%. Once the FDIC hears from the state or federal regulator, it says, huh, OK, I guess we're potentially on the hook for some deposits. We have to step in. They step in, they contact the bank, and say, guys, you look very undercapitalized. We have to figure out what to do with you. Okay? They hire an external financial advisor. They value the bank. They say, what are the bank's assets? How do these assets look? What's the loan portfolio? What, are the bank, what is this bank on the hook for in terms of uninsured deposits, bonds, and so on? When the financial advisors perform a valuation, the FDIC decides what to do with a failed bank. Are we going to liquidate it? Or are we going to try to sell it? Most of the time, they try to sell it. Okay? The way they sell a bank is they send an email blast to a bunch of buyers who in the past said, Hey, if you're selling a failed bank, let us know. Okay? You get this email saying, hey, would you be interested in buying a particular failed bank? You, of course, enter a confidentiality agreement, because it's pretty bad if people know a bank is failing. There's a bank run. Okay? So we don't want that. And then, as a potential buyer, what you get from the FDIC is kind of a book that tells you something about how the financial advisor evaluated this bank. You get some stuff about how good the loans are. What are some other assets on the balance sheet? Okay? You get some operational information about this bank, but you don't get all that much. Then you're told, OK, you got four to six days 
You can send in six to eight guys, they can perform due diligence, okay? That's all you get to evaluate whether you wanna buy a bank or not. That's really brief. I mean, think of how nor long normally M&A transactions take, okay? You gotta make this evaluation quickly, on the spot, okay? And then you have to submit a bid, okay? So there's gonna be bidding for this failed bank, and the FDIC, what it's supposed to try to do is minimize the costs, okay? When it sells a failed bank, they wanna sell it in principle for as much money as they can or to a good bidder such that FDIC doesn't suffer big costs. The way the bidding works is it starts to happen about 12 to 15 days before the closing. Sealed bids are submitted by potential buyers, okay? And then the buyer that is chosen is the one that the FDIC deems is gonna have least cost for the FDIC. Another interesting wrinkle is that the FDIC can actually decide if they wanna let you bid, okay? Not everyone is allowed to bid. You have to be either a charter bank or you have to have gotten a bank charter in process, which rarely happens, okay? You have to be in good standing on a bunch of dimensions, like your camels rating, which is how well are you doing, has to be high enough. Uh, you haven't, you know, you shouldn't have done any money laundering and things like that, okay? So a bunch of kind of standard requirements. Uh, and then there's a couple of quite interesting requirements. For example, if you're in state, you have to be twice as large as the failed bank. If you're out of state, I think it's four times as large. I think if you are in a non-contiguous state, you have to be six times as large as a failed bank to buy it, okay? But at the end, the FDIC says, you're the guys who can bid, these guys bid, FDI selects who wins, okay? That's kind of the process in the nutshell. So let's see what happens to these banks when they're sold, okay? First, what we're gonna try to understand is how far are banks sold? Is it true that now that we have deregulation, we have amazing IT, when a bank is failing in Oklahoma, a bank in California comes in and buys it, okay? The simple answer is no, okay? What I like about data is that you can reject quickly stories that people come up in in very complicated ways. So what do we see here? Only 15% of banks get sold out of state. If you thought that what was impeding bank sales out of state was some regulatory problems, that's not it, okay? That's not it. It seems that bank sales are very local, yes? How do you know the set of people that were invited, and how do you know it's not these laws that, you know, the twice as large, four times as large, whatever you're saying for stopping out of state sales? I will get to that. I, I actually know who bid. So I have pretty good information on who bid. Um, and I impose some of this stuff, so we'll see. But it is not those restrictions, and that's kind of, that's the fun part of it. Uh, yeah, so first, this is one way to see how local banks are. About 33% of banks are sold to a bank that's got a branch in the same zip code, okay? Not same state, same zip code. Another way to see how local failed bank sales are is what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take every other bank in the US that could potentially buy a failed bank, and we're not gonna impose any restrictions yet on those, okay? And then we're gonna say, what are the chances that if you live 461 to 533 miles away from the failed bank, that you acquire this bank? You know, chances are less than you know, a couple percent, okay? We're gonna do that for all banks, divvy it up in 20 bins. So this is the 5% of closest banks to the failed bank, according to how close is the average distance between branches. You can see that 5% of closest banks acquire 62% of failed banks. That means sales are local. Now, another way to see how local is, let's just look into this closest possible bin, okay? We're gonna take banks that are within 5%, that are 5% closest, we're gonna cut this in another 20 bins, okay? So here you see these are banks whose average branch distance between them and the failed bank is less than 20 miles. These are 0.25% closest banks to the failed bank. They acquire about 13% of failed banks, okay? So if you wanna understand how local failed bank sales are, they are extremely local, okay? You wanna guess who's gonna buy a failed bank? Guess someone really, really close, and you'll be, you'll be explaining a lot of the variation in the data, okay? If you don't believe me that this is sort of, that the pictures are sort of very simple and they cut data in a too simple way and banks have a lot of heterogeneity and so on, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna run a probability model. It's gonna be a logic model, where on the left-hand side we're gonna try to explain, are you likely to buy a failed bank? What are we gonna use as explanatory variables? It's how far is your, are your branches from the failed bank branches? So the same as that picture, but now we're gonna condition on a bunch of stuff, 
So in this column, what we do is we say, well, we better measure the distance relative to the failed bank. I mean, imagine some failed banks are just surrounded by a lot of banks that are close by. Other failed banks that are not that good, surrounded by very few banks, maybe that's what's driving it. So what we're going to condition for is we're going to do everything within a failed bank. Relative distance, you get a negative coefficient up there which tells you the farther away you are, the less likely you are to buy a failed bank. Okay? Then the last column, which I think is super interesting, is we're going to do the same exercise, but we'll also condition on a potential acquirer. Here's what I mean by that. Imagine that failed banks are kind of surrounded by really crummy banks. Okay? Then maybe these crummy banks can't buy the failed bank. So that will explain some of the distance of the results. So what we're going to do here is in this last column, we look at only other banks who have acquired a failed bank in the same quarter. So the, we only consider a potential set of acquirers that have acquired someone else, which means they had a good enough CRA rating, they had a good anti-money laundering record, and so on. And we get a much, much, much smaller sample. Even within these banks, what we find is that if you acquired a failed bank, you acquired the one that was closest to you out of the set of failed banks that were sold that quarter. So it's very unlikely that something else is driving this relationship. Okay? So I think what we can conclude from these pictures is Bank sales are extremely local. How, how important is this? If you live 100 miles farther away, your chances of acquiring a failed bank go down by about 14%. Okay? Now you might ask, uh, what does this tell us? Okay? You can be bought by a local guy for a lot of reasons. One is, if I'm bought by a local bank, they'll be able to close a bunch of branches, and maybe they're going to save some money that way. Or because there's going to be no competition, they'll be able to gouge their depositors and pay them very low interest rates. Okay? So this is market power. The alternative that we consider and we want to rule in is soft information. So here's what I mean. People have this idea in mind that what banks do is they screen loans. And when you screen a loan, there's two types of information you can get. There is hard information, information you can easily codify, like your earnings are high, your leverage is low, and so on. And then there's kind of soft information that's hard to transmit. Look, I've worked with Bob for the last five years. Bob is a good guy. He'll pay us back. Just trust me. Okay? And you can see how that information is quite difficult to transmit over the distances. Because your own boss might know whether you're a good judge of character. And they'll say, you know, Gregor's assessment of Bob is kind of worthwhile. Okay? This soft information is useful. But if it's someone who lives 1,000 miles away who's never met me, says, how do I know that you and Bob just don't live next door and you're bailing out your buddy Bob? You're telling me to give him a good loan. So soft information kind of declines over distance. And there's a whole literature that says, look, one of the things that banks do is process this kind of interesting soft information when they give loans. So if you're acquired by a bank far away, you're going to be losing this amazing soft information transmission. Okay? So how do we make this formal? How do I show you in the data that there's something here that has to do with soft information? There's this beautiful paper by another one of our colleagues, uh, Toby Moskowitz, with Mark Garmez, in which they have an interesting measure of soft information. They say, look, what do banks do? Most of the bank loans of US banks are real estate related. So let's measure how good information about real estate is in different places. And if the information is bad, we know that soft information plays a bigger role. Okay? They look at the, how precise public assessments of real estate are. Here's what I mean. In some places, if you go and look at the tax assessments that are given for real estate, those capture market values pretty darn well. You know that you know, the assessed real estate is always sort of 30% of the real market value. If you're an outsider, you look at those assessed numbers, you know how much you should pay for a house. In other, payment, in other places, it's kind of random. Okay? You go look at a real estate assessment, and you know nothing about how big this, how big this uh, how much this house should trade it for because, well, the public system is kind of all messed up and their assessments for taxes are crap. Okay? So that's what we're going to kind of exploit here. We're going to measure how well do tax assessments measure transaction values of houses. And we're going to say in places where they do that poorly, where you can't predict well, those are places in which soft information is super important. So what do we find? COD is the coefficient of dispersion that says, this is pretty badly measured information. Okay? So in places where you have high COD, 
in places in which you soft information is super important, the farther away you are, it's even harder to buy a local bank. So, but what, what these results are telling you is that the more soft information matters, the more locally a bank will be sold. Okay? And you can measure these different ways, cut it different ways, it all comes down to the same thing. So it seems like one of the reasons why failed banks are sold so locally is because potential buyers don't want to lose this soft information. And in areas where there's less soft information, the bank gets sold farther away. Okay? It's kind of the first thing you want to understand when you're thinking about how failed banks get allocated. The second thing we're going to look at is how specific the failed bank assets are. Okay? So here's what I mean by that. When you take over a bank, either those assets are very specialized, and only a specific type of buyer can use them well. For example, the bank is doing real estate business, and only a good bank that does real estate business can use those assets. Another way to think about bank assets is anyone can run a, run a bank, okay? If I buy a bank, if you buy a bank, if somebody else buys a bank, we can all kind of run it to the same tune, okay? So is that gonna play a role in failed bank sales? Here's what's interesting about failed banks. They are quite different in what they do, okay? Just as most US banks, they have a lot of holdings in real estate. So they do a lot of real estate loans, especially commercial real estate. But there's big differences in how much real estate you do. Standard deviation is about 20 percentage points, okay? So some banks do a lot of real estate loans, some banks do very few. Similar on residential real estate, okay? Some banks have portfolios that are very heavily leaning towards residential real estate, some that have very few residential real estate loans, okay? The other couple of dimensions on which banks differ is they offer other services. They offer fiduciary services, insurance services, some offer brokerage services, and so on. So the question is gonna be, do you have to understand a bank's business to buy it, or can any random bank buy a failed bank? Okay, that's sort of, that's the question. Are the assets specific? And here's a sort of very simple picture that should transmit most of what I wanna transmit. What we're gonna cut is we're gonna take all the banks that could potentially acquire a failed bank, gonna split them into five different buckets of how similar they are in their loan portfolio to the failed bank. If you're in this bucket, then, you, your real estate share of commercial real estate is the closest to that of the failed bank. If you're in this bucket, your commercial real estate share is really different, okay? They either make a lot of real estate, uh, commercial real estate loans and you do few, or they do few and you do a lot. But you're very different in this, uh, in, uh, in this one. So what do we see? It's a very simple pattern in the data, okay? You see that if you're very similar, you're much more likely to buy a failed bank than if you're very different. In other words, if you're a bank that specializes in commercial real estate, the chances you're gonna be bu bought by someone who specializes in construction loans are about 5%, okay? Very, very, very unlikely, even though this is 20% of all banks, okay? So what do we make of this? What we make of this is that it's important to match a failing bank with a buyer, okay? You don't want a failed bank to be bought by a buyer who doesn't do what they do, okay? How important is it? You can see that if you're quite different in how much commercial real estate you do, let's say one standard deviation different loan share, your chance of acquiring a failed bank drops about 10 percentage points. Similar for residential shares, okay? If the failed bank has an insurance business, a bank that doesn't have an insurance business is 5% less likely to acquire it, okay? So that tells us that failed bank assets are specific. That means they're specific to the type of lending they do, specific to the type of services they provide, you can't just buy a failed bank and say, you know you guys who are doing commercial real estate lending? From today on, we're gonna make you do you know, construction loans uh, or something like that. Okay, that just doesn't work. And this will be very important when we think about how we wanna sell these failed banks. Okay. So these are the two dimensions that we will talk about that are kind of natural, I think, which is who are kind of reasonable buyers of failed banks? The third dimension I wanna talk about is capitalization, which is even if you're quite a reasonable acquirer for a failed bank, you might not be able to afford it, okay? If you yourself are poorly capitalized, then when you try to buy a failed bank, it comes up, it's a really good deal, it's a really good match for you. You say, you know what? If I buy this bank, my capitalization ratio drops even more. I might be the next one to be a failing bank, so I just won't buy it, okay? So the question is, is that actually true in the data? Do low capitalized banks acquire other failed banks? And what's more important is 
does the fact that some banks are poorly capitalized affect where failed banks get sold? So two simple cuts of the data. Okay? The first one is we're going to look at banks that are close to the failed bank. Okay? So we're already going to sort on likely acquirers. And then we're going to say, these are the guys who, are, who could acquire a failed bank are well capitalized. These are the 20% of other banks who could acquire a failed bank, but are the most poorly capitalized 20%. Simple pattern in the data. Okay? If you're poorly capitalized, your chances are of acquiring a failed bank are about 10%, even though you're 20% of all banks. If you're well capitalized, it's over 25, 27%. Okay? So it seems like capitalization does matter for acquisition. What is much, much, much more important is that capitalization matters for who buys the failed bank. Here's what I mean by that. What we have here is how far does a failed bank get sold is what we're trying to explain. Okay? What we're using to explain that is how well capitalized are the local banks. And what this first regression shows you is that when banks surrounding a failed bank are poorly capitalized, the bank gets sold farther away. The second picture shows you that, uh, oh, sorry, no, uh, I'll take it this back. This is just the same as the picture. Ah, I think this picture shows you that. Sorry. So here, the first row shows you that when local guys are poorly capitalized, the bank gets sold farther away. And when local banks who are in similar lines of business are poorly capitalized, you get sold to a farther away bank in a different line of business. Okay? Why is that important? Imagine now what's likely to happen when a bank is failing. A bank is likely failing because the local market was hit with a bad shock, which means that other banks around this failing bank are likely poorly capitalized. So these are exactly the times when you want to sell a failed fail bank. You want to sell it to these local guys who are in similar lines of business because they can run the bank the best. But they can't because they're poorly capitalized. So now we get bad sales decisions. Banks sold farther away to banks, who, to people who don't really know how to run them that well. They're in different lines of business. Okay? The questions we're going to ask now is twofold. Number one, what in the world drives these allocation decisions? And does this matter for FDIC costs? So the questions here before was, wait a second. Do banks get sold locally because farther away banks don't like to bid on a failed bank? Or is it because the FDIC doesn't let them do it? Because those are two important distinctions, right? If the FDIC is preventing these banks to be sold from far away, then maybe FDIC is screwing up. If banks don't get sold far away because, well, the guys far away don't want to buy these banks, it's because they don't value these banks highly. Okay? Two really important different channels of how these banks get allocated. So how are we going to disentangle these two? Well, we know there's a bunch of different criteria for how the FDIC admits bidders. Okay? Some are bank specific. These we can easily deal with when we, do, when we look at acquirers who've acquired a failed bank. They satisfy this criteria because they were allowed to buy another bank. The ones that are hard are the ones that are relative to the target. Are you big enough to acquire a target in your own state? And so on. Two things we're going to do. First, we're going to restrict our sample to any bank that actually satisfies the FDIC criteria. And if we do that, all the results look pretty much identical. Not similar, like identical, which is quite unusual. The second thing we're going to do is then we're going to look at only, only buyers who actually placed a bid on a bank. So what we're going to try to understand is of the bidders who actually placed a bid on a bank, which one is most likely to win the failed bank auction? And what you'll find is that it's the banks who are close, it's the banks who are most similar, and it's the banks who are best capitalized. Okay? So you'll get the same set of results, uh, which kind of tells us Banks far away don't want to bid for a failed bank. It's not that the FDIC says you're not allowed to do it. No, they just don't value it very highly because they lose all this good soft information. Okay? The last thing we need to tie this into is how costly is this for the FDIC? Because this is sort of in some ways the primary motivation. Okay? We have this nice insurance program that allows us all to place deposits in banks, but it's not a free insurance program. Okay? If banks fail, FDIC has to cough up the costs. And the question is, do the forces we've discovered that sort of drive the allocation of failed banks have anything to do with how costly this stuff is for the FDIC? So how big are FDIC costs of bank failures? 
They're about 30% of assets of failed banks. That's large. The other thing that's quite interesting is they differ quite a lot between banks. Okay? What do I mean by that? Some banks have small resolution costs. Some banks have high resolution costs, an order of 40, even 60%. Okay? What we're trying to understand is, do the facts that I've showed you about allocation of failed banks have anything to do with how costly this is for the FDIC? Here's a simple picture. Now what we've been sorting is failed banks. Every one of these buckets has 20% of failed banks. Okay? And the way we sorted them is how well capitalized are the banks surrounding the failed bank. So the guys who kind of you know should be buying you, the closed guys in a similar line of business, do they have a lot of capital? Or do they have, oh sorry, do they have little capital or do they have a lot of capital? Okay? What you see is that for banks that are surrounded by well capitalized other banks, the FDIC costs are on the order of 24%. So high, but not crazy, okay? If you're surrounded by very poorly capitalized banks, so you're in the 20% of banks that had bad neighbors, then your costs are substantially higher. They're on the order of 33%, okay? So this means that at least the raw data is kind of telling you a story that I've been trying to tell you. It matters who buys this failed bank. Now, I know also that I'm in a room surrounded by skeptics, okay? So if I see this picture, what would worry me if I were in the audience? Here's what would worry me. I've told you before that local banks are likely poorly capitalized simply because, well, regional shocks hit everyone, right? How do banks fail? The region is probably performing poorly. But if the region is performing poorly, it doesn't affect just the local bank. It affects everybody around it, right? That's why they're poorly capitalized. Then you should say, wait a second, doesn't that mean that when you're telling us these banks are poorly capitalized, it's not that they're poorly capitalized, it's they're crummy banks, okay? And the failing bank is a really crummy bank because, well, it was hit by really this really bad shock. And these guys were hit by a really good shock. So why does that have to, anything to do with what we were talking about, okay? Isn't this just driven by a failed bank being worse in places where you have a lot of poorly capitalized local banks? So to get around that, we have, to be kind of, we have to be a little bit clever, okay? We have to think about how can we get some banks that surround the failed bank to be better capitalized or worse capitalized without that inducing the, anything about the quality of the failed bank, okay? So you need something that's gonna push around the capitalization of surrounding banks and not push around the quality of the failed bank. So here's what we did. We're gonna take all the banks that surround the failed bank. We know that these, failed ba that these surrounding banks have branches outside of the regions where the failed bank has, has branches, okay? In particular, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at only branches of the surrounding banks that are in states that do not overlap with the states in which failed, the failed bank does business. So they have nothing in common, those branches, okay? I'm, you, the failed bank has only branches in Nevada, so I'm gonna look at only failed bank, uh, the surrounding bank branches in Massachusetts. Then I'm gonna look at this other states. I'm gonna see how real estate prices dropped in those areas, okay? Because we know that the easiest way to understand how well capitalized the bank is, is through real estate shocks, because all their loans are in real estate, okay? So if there's two banks surrounding a failed bank, one had branches in Massachusetts, one had branches in Phoenix, okay? Then the guy in Phoenix clearly suffers way more because Phoenix real estate dropped a lot. That's what we're kind of exploiting to get ourselves a shock to capitalization that's got nothing to do with a failed bank. When we do that, we find similar results to that picture, of course, in a sort of in a regression setting. How big are those results? Modest, but not small. Okay, so a standard deviation, how well capitalized your neighbors are, explains about 13, 14% of the standard deviation in the FDIC costs. Standard deviation of the FDIC costs is on the order of, we said, a ballpark of 20%, so you know, 3, 4% of assets of a failed bank. Is that small? Well, I don't know. I mean, this is sort of 500 banks failing times 4% of their assets. It so, can be quite substantial, okay? We do a couple of other things to convince you that these results hold. Uh, we condition on sort of the complex bit characteristics you see. Uh, another thing we do is the way you estimate the cost to the FDIC is you let the FDIC do its cost estimates. Instead, we construct our own. 
same things shine through, okay? So we have all these facts now, and I want to step a little bit back and say, what in the world are we going to do with these facts, okay? I've shown you the following. Failed banks are bought by local banks in similar lines of business. If the, guys in local, uh, if the local guys are poorly capitalized, these banks get sold farther away to, buy, uh, to banks in worse lines of business, and that has cost the FDIC. From a policy perspective, the question that begs itself is, well, so what? What have we learned? You showed us a bunch of pretty pictures. Do we care? Okay. And the way to think about the results is the way I've been kind of trying to push them throughout, throughout the whole uh, presentation. Okay. The way I think about these results is the following. Who are the best buyers for a failed bank? Well, it better be the local guys and the guys in similar lines of business because they're willing to pay most. How do we know they're willing to pay most? Because they win auctions. Okay, so these are the best buyers. Here's a problem. Best buyers a lot of times are poorly capitalized because they're hit by similar shocks as the failed bank. When the best potential buyers are poorly capitalized, you sell this bank to worse buyers. Okay, worse buyers are the guys who are farther away in different lines of business. So instead of selling a bank to someone local who's gonna be able to use the soft information, who's gonna know how to run your business, you sell it to sort of someone who's an opportunistic buyer who's not going to run this bank as efficiently, but hey, they're well capitalized so they can step in. Okay? So this will lead to worse buyers getting these failed banks. It will also lead to higher costs of the FDSC. So you have to care about this from a policy perspective at least on two dimensions. We should already care about how well banks are run after they've been acquired, and then we care about sort of how much this costs FDSC. So the lesson I want you to draw from this is quite simple. Selling failed banks is not a magical solution that will resolve the whole problem, okay? It's not one of these things where when we can now step in and say, look, why are you worried about human capital and relationships of a bank? Sell it, a bank from Oklahoma can buy a bank in California or vice versa, and we all go on living happily ever after. That is not the case in the data. In the data, what we see is you sell a failed bank at a time of a crisis, it gets sold to worse acquirers at a higher cost to the FDIC, there's fire sales in failed banks, and that's something we have to keep in mind, okay? It's a cost in this whole process that affects both allocation of failed banks and the cost of the taxpayers, okay? So these frictions are not gonna be negligible. Okay? So to wrap up, what did you learn from this talk? I would say there's four facts that you learned from this talk. One is bank sales are very local, and by very local I mean less than 50% of banks get sold out of state. That might not seem very surprising to you. It surprises all the bank experts we've talked to. Okay, so it seems like the fact that sales banks are so locally sold is quite stunning. Okay, banks are sold to similar potential acquirers, the guys who work doing the same line of business, and capitalization of potential acquirers massively distorts matching between who should be buying the failed bank from a social perspective and who actually does. So I think that those facts tell us. Frictions in a sales bank, pro in a selling sales bank are there, they matter. So now the question is, are we done? Should I therefore say, okay, well, if failed bank sales don't work super well, should we therefore bail banks out? Well, the problem is we actually don't know anything about the other side of the coin. We don't know how costly it is to bail out banks because we don't know how costly moral hazard is. We don't really have a chapter 11 for banks, we can't tell you that, okay? so. I see this as a first piece in a mosaic that tells us, at the end of the day, when, we, when a next crisis hits, or if a next crisis hits, we want to dispose of failed banks. Now we know sales are costly, we know how much. We don't know about the other things yet, but I think that's for academics to figure out in the future, okay? Thank you very much, and I'm happy to listen to questions now. Do you have any measurement for the uh, performance of banks who are sold? Uh, because uh, I'm concerned, <clears throat> what's what's happened to the f uh, banks who are sold? You know, if if they are, uh, maybe we, we think that th some buyers are potentially bad buyers, some are good buyers. But uh, in practice, we can we see that those bad buyers are actually performing the bank very well. Uh, do you have anything like this? So you're 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 asking whether the failed bank guys have any say in sales? Mm, yeah. They have none. Once you've failed, the FDIC runs the ship, okay? You can't decide where you want to be sold. The FDIC comes in and says, you screwed up. You got no powers anymore. We're running the show. 
we're selling the bank. And then the question is, are we selling it right? I think what I've shown you is not that the FDIC is making mistakes. I've simply shown you that because areas get generally, all banks in an area generally get hit at the same time, the people who you'd love to sell the bank to don't have the capital to buy it. And that'll lead to distortions. That doesn't mean FDIC is getting something wrong. I mean, there might, but that's, this paper doesn't get there. Yeah, but but, but if, a, if a bank is sold, do you have any measure, measure of performance of that ah, sold bank? I see. So, you, so no. So right now, we do have measures. We haven't looked at them yet. So right now, what we look at is how much does, the FD, how much does it cost the FDIC? So we looked at it from the perspective of the seller, but not whether this is sort of this bank now performs magically much better or worse when you get a different allocation. That would be interesting. It, I agree. I think there's. I think actually there's a lot of really interesting things here. I mean, this is sort of. We haven't had a paper on failed banks since the 1980s. This is the first one. I'm hoping it's not the last. Uh, I mean, I think it's an important literature that, that we need to understand better. Uh, does the FDIC have an interest in uh, encouraging an out-of-state purchase uh, to prevent like concentration of market power? I think they they might. Uh, they might. I think market power is one of the things they're supposed to consider. Although, they're, let me be precise. Their mandate actually says minimize costs to the FDIC, uh, to the deposit insurance fund. So in principle, they shouldn't. In practice, I think they care. We have been wanting to look at market power. We just haven't gotten there yet. We, it's an important thing. I think it's, it's interesting. What's bizarre is that they just out-of-state bank sales just don't seem to happen much. I mean, forget out-of-state, out-of-zip code. Uh, which is so that kind of tells you market power might be some of the things driving it. So we haven't ruled it down, we haven't ruled it in. All we did is rule in soft information. It seems to matter. Uh, there's two observations here. Uh, one is very reinforcing. Bob DeYoung has written sort of an IO overview, of IO of banking. It was in that Oxford Handbook of Banking, a really nice survey. And he's covering previous decades that show the big sweep of the nationalization and the computerization. Anything that can be consolidated where there's economies of scale, they've been done. So yours is actually in keeping with this. What's left? It's all the local market information. And this is reinforced with my recent experience with, with real cool. estate. It is that neighborhood information is Seems really handled terribly by national bank yeah um so you just don't trust their housing because uh, offices because they're they're grouping by you know whole zip codes don't even make sense um and so when they do averages for a region of a, a subset of a state a couple counties um they're just missing a whole bunch of local market information yeah so i mean i i i agree i think you know it's interesting to ask so how do how do you you know if you're a big national bank, how do you approve a loan? I think generally you have an algorithm. And you plug in the very hard information, and out pops a yes or a no or an interest rate, right? Yeah, um, it, it doesn't take a part, account of things like, well, across this side of the street, you've got other attributes. Exactly, exactly. So I, I completely agree with that. I think, uh, I mean, we need to better link up in the paper with that literature. I think we've done it a little bit. We need to be better about it. Right. So Ma I am just, this is to the graduate students. Monica Piazzesi's talk earlier was lightly attended, but the detailed information that she's doing with the Zillow uh, stuff in the Santa Cruz area, that's all very related in terms of the, the, the local market effects on, on bond market bonds. I agree. This particular I agree. Kind of bonds. I'll, I'll should look at that. Thank you. If your premise is that uh, the soft information is what is valuable in local banks buying more local banks, and that typically banks have assets that are embedded in the commercial and residential real estate of the local economy, wouldn't you be better off uh, separating the assets from the people such that the assets could be diversified? Otherwise, you just create a bigger bank that's even more susceptible to uh, local shocks. So you're saying I'm pushing for specialization matters. I'm saying sort of, look, specializing is good, uh, local is good. There is a dark side of that, which is sort of, well, but when you're specialized, um, you're hit by shocks, and likely all your commercial real estate is hit by the same shock, so you're more likely to fail. When you're all concentrated in one little neighborhood, well, real estate shocks can be local, and you're more likely to die. So why in the world shouldn't you kind of diversify more, get, to, get rid of some of that bankruptcy risk? I think that's an interesting, I think it's an interesting observation. I think just, that's why I kind of, that's why I kind of say this is an empirical paper that just says, what do they actually do? And should they do something else? 
possible. I mean, here's, I think, an interesting policy angle on what they're saying. I think the policy angle is, is the FDIC, should I want them to be a bit more diversified so they're less likely to fail? The answer is, honestly, I don't know. Um, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting consideration uh, that I just, I, I don't know. I don't know much because we, we know very little about, about sort of how banks fail. Uh, yeah, so thank you. That's, I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea to explore. Thank you very much.